Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this Trade Station webinar. My name is Jesus Nava. I'm the Director of Client Training and Education for Trade Station Securities. It's always a pleasure to be doing these presentations for everyone, especially in this topic of zero DTE options. Um, our guest speaker, Matt Cashman, is from the OIC, the Options Industry Council. We'll pass the microphone over to him in just a moment. But he's prepared a great presentation that talks about how to trade zero DTE options, uh, specifically using debit ver verticals. So um, it's a great topic and we're glad to have him. I'm also very glad to see so many people connected here today. Thank you for taking time out of your schedules to learn a little bit about you know, these types of options. Let's go through some disclosures before we start this presentation. Keep in mind that every symbol and idea that we talk about is for educational purposes only. Uh, these are not recommendations of trade station. Uh, also that online trading is not suitable for everyone, especially when it comes to options which carry a higher degree of risk. Past historical performance is no guarantee of future results. And I also want to point out that Matt Cashman, even though he's our guest speaker, he's not affiliated with trade station and uh, trade station does not endorse any third party content. But at the same time, we're very happy to have him here since he's an expert on uh, on options and his insights are going to are very, very welcome. So let's go ahead and um, introduce our guest speaker now. Um, as I said before, I think I went a little bit too fast here. Um, his name is Matt Cashman. I'll let him do his introduction. Matt, are you ready? Microphone on? Yeah, I'm all good. Thanks for that okay. wonderful introduction, Jesus. My name is Matt Cashman. I'm the principal of investor education at OCC and OIC. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on myself, I started trading options around 1998. I've been an options trader ever since. I got my start in Chicago on the board of options exchange. Many of you will know it as the CBOE. I traded on the floor um, starting in 1998 in single stock equities and indexes. Pretty quickly after that, I moved to London, where I traded interest rate uh, options there for about three years. And then I moved back to the United States and started um, an index options market making business that I ran with a couple of partners, again, on the floor of the CBOE for the better part of about a decade in Chicago. Uh, I wound that down in probably 2015 or so. And since then, I have been uh, working for the OIC and the OCC. Um, as an, an OIC industry uh, council instructor in, in options, what we do here at OIC is really we try to educate the public as to the benefits and the risks of exchange traded options through many of the different kind of uh, many of the different ways that we put education out there, mainly through our website and uh, things like this with our uh, strategic partners like TradeStation, where we're doing webinars or podcasts or things of that nature, with the idea behind it being that we are constantly providing uh, industry agnostic information about options themselves and to try to educate people as to how they work more broadly so that people can utilize that information to make better educated and informed options decisions when they're investing with options on a daily basis. So that's really where I come from and that's my background. Um, let me start to share my screen if that's all right, Jesus. Yes, I stopped my share. So you can go oh. ahead and share your screen. Okay, great. Thank you. There we are. There we are. So um, the one thing that I always like to do is give my own disclaimer. I hope you guys can see that. Jesus, can you see that? Yes, yes, I can. Okay, great. So uh, options involve risk. They're not suitable for everyone. Any strategy that I discuss is uh, for um, illustrative and educational purpose. Please do not construe it as a recommendation to buy or sell securities. A little bit of housekeeping. The following trademarks that you will see are wholly owned by the Options Clearing Corporation, OCC, and OIC. You'll see them used in the presentation throughout. And then a little bit about OIC, where I work, the Options Industry Council. It's the educational arm of our parent company, the OCC, the Options Clearing Corporation. 
OCC is the largest clearing corporation of equity and index exchange traded options in the world. Basically, if you are trading an option that is an exchange traded option in the United States, somewhere along the line, it is going through the hands of OCC, either in clearing and settlement or exercise and assignment. The OCC touches that option somewhere in the background after it's traded or during the exercise and assignment process. The best part about being an employee of OIC is that we, as I said before, are an industry resource, which means everything that we do is based in the idea that we are educating the public. We do that generally through optionseducation.org, our website, which you can see here. There you, you can find courses, podcasts, videos, webinars. All of our educational resources are offered free of charge and on demand to the public because we are fully funded by the OCC. Now, you can also send us email questions at options at the OCC.com, which you can see right here. We are not investment advisors. I think it's important to let people know that, but this email address right here, you can send emails to, and it's staffed by four people on the investor education desk that cumulatively have 100 years of industry experience with options, options trading, options market making, and brokerage. And so we have a wide range of people that understand all of the different parts of options trading, and we can help in, in educating you as to what's going on possibly with your option trades. Now, like I said, we're not registered investment advisors, so we can't direct you on trades, but we love to educate people as to how options work, and we're pretty good at it. So uh, with that said, let's move on to a little bit of information Options volume over the last 23 years, we always present, I always present this slide as the beginning of my presentation because I like to drive home the idea that options in general and the volume has exploded over the last two decades. What you'll see here is from 2000 to 2023, you're looking at in 2000, roughly a billion contracts of actual exchange traded volume. And last year in 2023, the exchange traded volume was 11.3 billion contracts. Now you can see when you look at this, that the big jump here was actually in 2020 because of lots of different reasons. People will you know, say that there's a lot of different reasons as to why this happened. COVID was a really motivating factor for a lot of people as far as options are concerned. And a lot of people got involved in the marketplace at that point in time. When I look at this and I think about what's happened since 2020, I think about it from an educational perspective. And from my seat, it becomes that much more integral as to what is going on in the marketplace that there's enough education out there for people to understand how these options work and how they might use them on a daily basis. So I always just give people a little bit of a frame of reference here as to how this might Hell, like what kind of numbers we're actually talking about as far as these numbers are concerned in the options world. And it's a significant jump over the last two decades. So keep that in mind. That's part of the reason why we're doing what we're doing as far as education is concerned. Let's talk really specifically about how we're going to dive into this today. I'm going to give you a little bit of a history as to where we are with zero DTE options right now as it stands and how we got here. Because this wasn't something that just came out of nowhere. It didn't drop out of the sky. Nobody cooked this up in a laboratory anywhere. These are options that are actually just normal options, but the cadence of expirations has changed over time to the point where now we have, in certain products, expirations that happen on a daily basis. I'll give you a little bit of history as to how that happened and why. I'll talk about the sensitivity of options as time passes, because what I want to do is give you a real general base of knowledge about how time and optionality work hand in hand to allow you to better utilize that concept and use it in lots of different places, because it's not just zero DTE options where you can utilize that knowledge. You can use it across the board and in many different asset classes, because optionality is something that exists in the same way across the board. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. We'll dive into Gamma, which is one of the Greeks of options over time, Vega of those options over time, another one of the Greeks, and Delta of options over time. We'll talk about how those different Greeks react to time as time compresses or as time pulls out of the life cycle of an option as you get closer to expiration. So we'll talk about that as well. 
And I'm going to give you a move comparison. This is something that I utilize when I talk about zero DTE options to drive home the point that you can have the same option that has zero days to expiration and 30 days to expiration and have the same underlying move that's happening in the stock or the index or whatever it is underneath and take a look at how those options might change in value as a function of how much time they have in them because it's completely different when you start to talk about duration as you go back and forth. And then we'll talk about vertical spreads and debit verticals and how you might use them. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A. Let's dig right in. DTE, everyone talks about zero DTE. Well, what are they talking about? They're talking about an option that has zero days to expiration. DTE stands for days to expiration. Thus, if you have an option with 30 DTE in it, it's gonna be a 30 days to expiration option. 10 days, obviously 10 days to expiration, five days, five days to expiration, all the way down to zero DTE. What is a zero DTE option? It is an option that is at its expiration date. It only means that this option is expiring today. It doesn't mean that this option was created this morning and is closing and expiring today. What it means is that this option has come to the end of its life cycle. That's all that that means. And thus, every single option that has lived in its entire life cycle, in the high, entire history of options, has at one point been a zero DTE option. On what day? On its last day of expiration. I drive the point home consistently when I talk about this, that I used to trade zero DTE options before anyone ever called them zero DTE options, and we just called them expiration Friday options. Because a long time ago, before 2005, options only really expired on the third Friday of every month. And I'll talk about that when I give you a little bit of the history of how we got here. But I wanna drive home the point that a zero DTE option is a regular old option that just happens to be expiring on that day. We'll talk about what kind of risk characteristics they have on their last day or as they get closer to expiration. But that concept is really important here. I don't really like it when people talk about them as their own asset class, because that's not really what these are. These are just options that happen to be expiring today. With that said, let's move on. How did we get here? How do we get to the timeline where we actually have an expiration on every day? Now, Expiration on every day doesn't exist in every asset class out there. It's in specific places. Most of those are in indexes currently, but you're seeing the prevalence of this expand into other asset classes. For instance, they're starting to talk about doing it in Europe. They're starting to talk about doing it in commodities. It's starting to look like things are going to expand as far as the actual cadence of expirations in different asset classes. That's part of the reason why it's so important to talk about how these options act when you get close to expiration. But here's the timeline of how these expirations got added. I was trading SPX options in 1998, basically. 1998, 1999, all the way through to 2015, essentially. I remember when the CBOE told us that they were gonna add weekly expirations in 2005. From a market maker's perspective, adding weekly expirations was kind of a pain, to be honest. Why is that? Well, I used to have to only deal with expiration of these options every third Friday. And now the CBOE was telling me I have to deal with it every single Friday. And that, when you think about, and after we learn a little bit about how the risk of these options works as you get closer to expiration, you'll understand why that can feel like a heavy lift from a market making standpoint, because all of a sudden what you have is this different iterative risk that's happening three times more every month as opposed to just once. So they announced in 2005, they were gonna add weekly expirations, which means every Friday we're gonna expire an option. Then in 2016, they added Wednesdays and Mondays. And then in 2022, they added Tuesdays and Thursdays, which rounded out the entire cycle. Now, if you look, we obviously have Fridays, Wednesdays, Mondays, and Tuesdays and Thursdays. You have one every day. Now, when they added Friday expirations previous to this, the 
expiration only happened on the third Friday and volume was really concentrated around those expirations, but it was more evenly distributed across the entire curve. Once they started to add these weeklies, what you got was a significant rotation into volume in this weekly option. Once they added Wednesdays, which was in 2016, this was the first time that they added an expiration that was not on a Friday. They had had nine years of Friday expirations, but by the time they added Wednesdays, 30% of index volumes were already centered in a weekly option. Now, this information runs contrary to much of what you're going to hear from people, especially who are looking at this and seeing volume numbers that are centered in these zero DTE options. Many people like to look at that and put that in the headline of their news story and say, 40% of options are now zero DTE options. The reality of the situation is that ever since they started adding weekly expirations in, 20, in, in 2005, the actual volume has been migrating that direction the entire time. And where we are now is just that this is the end result of many of these expirations being added. So after they added Wednesdays in 2016, they added Mondays also in 2016. Again, roughly 30% of the option volume was centered in these weekly options at this point in time. Then fast forward to 2022, which was last year, or actually two years ago uh, now, um, Tuesdays and Thursdays get added, rounds out the entire cycle. At this point, you're dealing with roughly 40 to 45% of the volume being in these zero DTE or weekly or short duration options. Now I give this history to you to make sure that I drive the point home, that this is not something that just fell out of the sky in 2022. This has been something that has been happening over time, slowly but surely, and most of it has been pushed along by these index options that have been listed Fridays first, then Wednesdays and Mondays got added, and then Tuesdays and Thursdays in 2022. So that's how we got to where we are. The reality of the situation is that these daily, op these daily expirations in these options exist, and much of the volume is centered in those options on those days. So how are we going to deal with it? Well, from my perspective, what we're going to do is we're going to teach people how these options work on the days that are closer and closer and closer to expiration. How do you do that? You talk about the sensitivity of these options as time passes, as time comes out of these options. So how does time influence option pricing? Relative to these actual Greeks that we talked about at the beginning, let's talk about those. Delta, how does time influence Delta? As expiration approaches in the money options, tend toward the upper bound of 100 delta and out of the money options tend toward the lower bound of zero delta. So that's how delta gets affected. As you pull time out, an option that's in the money is going to become more in the money. An option that is out of the money is going to become more out of the money. That's how delta works. Gamma, how does gamma work as far as options when you're dealing with time? First of all, gamma is highest in short-term options and at the money options. I always say this when I'm talking about gamma, if you're looking for an option that has the most gamma on the board, which is gamma is a way to measure how much an option is, its ability to change in delta. I think of gamma as a measure of potential energy in an option. If you're looking for an option that has the highest gamma on the board, Look at the at the money option with the lowest amount of time to expiration because that's where you're going to find an option that has a lot of gamma or a lot of potential to change its state or change its delta, which is really what gamma does. Gamma is highest in short-term options and at the money options. And as time passes, gamma increases for the at the money options and decreases for the options that are out of the money or deep in the money. We'll talk about both of these as we go on, and I'll give you some visuals to look at how that works. Theta. Theta is an options one day theoretical decay. As far as your model is concerned, theta just tells you if this option's worth three bucks today and it has 10 cents of theta, and you fast forward your clock 24 hours to this time tomorrow, that option on your model should theoretically be worth 
be worth $2.90. That's all. If everything else stays constant, theta is the amount of just pure value that comes out of that option in a 24 hour time period. That's all theta is. Theta is generally centered around extrinsic value, not intrinsic value. And so when you're dealing with theta, you're gonna be dealing with options that are either at the money or out of the money because they have the most percentage of their value tied up in extrinsic value. And that's part of the reason why theta is so high around options that are at the money and zero DTE options. Theta is concentrated because they have very limited amounts of time. Think about this. If you have an option that has 100 days in it and you take one day out of it, as far as value is concerned, you're taking one day out of 100 days. If you have an option that has one day in it and you take that one day out, you're taking 100% of its time value out of that option. And thus, the percentage of the amount of value that's coming out of it is going to be significantly higher. That's part of the reason why theta is so high around these options that are zero DTE options. Vega, which is an option sensitivity to implied volatility levels, is proportional to time. As you go farther out in the duration curve, options have more Vega in them, generally speaking. And so they are more sensitive to implied volatility moves they are actually less sensitive to underlying moves because why? They have less gamma in them as you go farther out on the curve. I'll show you this in graphic form that'll hopefully give you a little bit of a better idea as to how this works more generally. So delta, gamma, theta, and vega. These are the top kind of Greeks that people use to measure options. And this is how time influences those Greeks specifically. This is something you can go back and kind of reference when you're thinking about how this option that I'm about to trade, how might it look tomorrow? Or how might time as it comes out affect the actual risk that's involved with this option? And this is a good reference for you to actually look at that relative to time. Let's dive right into gamma. Like I said before, the gamma of an option is centered in the at the money option and the closest to expiration option. That's when you're gonna find options with high gamma. Why? Gamma is a delta sensitivity to stock price moves. Gamma is how much the delta of your option is gonna move if the underlying moves a dollar, basically. Now, it is usually expressed as a decimal and keeping all factors constant, if you were to look at something like this that said 0 0.002, you could look at that and say, this option has two gamma. What does that mean? That means that if the option starts with a 90 delta and the stock moves up by a dollar and it's a call, theoretically, the option should then, after that dollar move, have a 92 delta. And the actual move in that delta should come from the gamma of that option. That's why I call gamma potential change that's inside an option. It is the ability for this option to change its delta over the course of a move. Thus, the higher that a delta or the higher that gamma is in an option, the more potential change that exists within that option. It's considered an adjustment to delta. People talk about it like an adjustment to delta and only options have gamma. This is something that people don't always necessarily understand. The optionality that exists within these options is where the gamma comes from. And it's really important to think about that when you think about how this option might change if things move, because inevitably the underlying is going to move. That's one of the things that you should rely on is things move around. It's a dynamic marketplace and the options are going to change relative to these movements in underlying. Now, Here's a visual representation of what gamma looks like across strikes. Remember what I said about gamma. Gamma exists in its highest, it's most concentrated in the at the money option and in the option that is closest to expiration. If we're looking at strikes here, consider this like the strikes of an option uh, matrix. The 20s, the 21s, the 22s, the 23s, the 20s, et cetera, et cetera. If this is a $25 strike, 
and this is the 20 or a $25 stock, sorry. And this is the 25 strike. This is where the gamma is most concentrated. It's in your at the money option. These would be the in the money calls or the out of the money puts. And these would be the out of the money calls or the in the money puts, right? The 30 put on a $25 option is an in the money put. And the 20 call is an in the money call on a $25 option. But the 25 call and put are the at the money options. And that is where the gamma is going to be most concentrated. Why is that? Because that is where the actual potential to change of the delta is the highest. Now, let's talk about how gamma works as a function of time. Because we also talk about it's most concentrated in the at the money option, the option that is closest to where the stock or the underlying is trading right now. But it's also most concentrated in shorter term options. I want you to look at this. Remember what we talked about? That option that we said on the gamma page had 0 0.002 would be considered a two gamma option. If you're looking at the at the money option on a, let's say a $50 stock, this is what the actual gamma of these options looks like when you have zero days to expiration, the day that it's expiring. Look at how much higher this is relative to five days to expiration, right? This would be like a weekly option, a Friday option on a Monday. 10 days, this is a two week option. 30 days, this is a month option. And this is a three month option. Look at how this looks as far as the numbers are concerned. Now it's expressed as a decimal. So it's not always easy to take a look at that and see what that really looks like, which is why we give a graph here. The zero DTE option has so much more gamma than that 90 day option. It's extremely concentrated in, in a very short period of time. The reason why is because the same move in the underlying and I'll talk about this later. The same move in the underlying on a zero DTE option is going to change that option significantly. Whereas if you have a 90-day option, it might not change it at all. It might just be a non-event. And that's a function of how much gamma exists in those options over time. So as you go out in time, you get less gamma and more vega as you go out in time. We'll talk about that in a second. But this is really how gamma is concentrated in these zero DTE options. Let's talk about Vega. Vega is an options sensitivity to implied volatility moves. Now, what I said before is that Vega is proportional to time. And what that looks like is that as you go out in time, it's going to look almost exactly the opposite of gamma over time. As you add days to an option's duration, what you end up with is more vega or more sensitivity to implied volatility moves. You can see this, zero DTE options do not have very much vega in them. They're not very sensitive to implied volatility moves. What are they sensitive to? They're sensitive to underlying moves because they have a lot of gamma in them. They don't have a lot of vega. Now I said that it's proportional to time. What does that look like? It looks like this, it's pretty proportional. It has a little bit of curvature to it over duration, but not as much curvature as there is to the gamma profile of options as far as duration is concerned. You can look at this and say, this has two cents of vega in it, whereas this has 20, almost 20 cents of vega. And so vega is how much an option is going to move if you move the implied volatility up 1% or down 1%. That's not going to affect these options very much that are in the front of the curve. Why? Because they don't have very much vega. They're not going to move very much as far as implied vol is going to move. Now, what is going to move those options in the zero DTE? The actual move in the underlying is going to move them an awful lot. Let's contrast gamma versus vega as a function of time. This is just the two graphs that I just gave you overlaid on top of each other. And what this is meant to show you is these two graphs give you what kind of, right here, gamma that exists in the zero DTE option and vega that exists in the zero DTE option. 
This is where your zero DTE options live. They have a ton of gamma in them and not very much vega. And as you add days, as you add duration to it, what you end up with is an option that might be a little bit less sensitive to underlying movement, meaning it has less gamma, and more sensitive to the implied volatility movement, meaning it has more vega. You can see this. This is the amount of vega that's in these options. This is the amount of gamma that's in these options. So this is the front of the curve. This is the zero DTE option. And this is those 90 day options. This is three month options back here. You'll notice they have a lot of Vega in them and very little gamma. So this option back here is gonna be really sensitive to implied vol moves, but it's going to be very kind of ambivalent to underlying moves relative to these options that are going to only really care about how much the stock is moving and not really matter how much the implied volatility is moving. Why? Because they don't have very much vega in, but they have a ton of gamma in. Okay, so that's how gamma and vega actually work in that front part of the curve. <laughs> Let's talk about delta over time. Here's your option delta definition. It is the sensitivity of your option to underlying moves. That's basically what it really is. It's a measure of how much your option should move up or down for every dollar that the underlying stock or the underlying index moves. Now, you can really break this down into three buckets. Deep in the money options are approaching 100 delta. 100 delta, if you think about this, would mean that the option itself is going to move one for one with the actual underlying. If it has 100 delta and the stock goes up and it's a call, theoretically, as far as your model is concerned, that call should also go up by a dollar. Why? Because it has a hundred delta, meaning it should move a hundred percent of the underlying move. Now, at the money options or the second bucket, they generally have 50 delta, around a 50 delta. At the money options are those options that are centered around where the stock is trading right now. Remember what I said about those options. That's where the gamma is most concentrated, 50 or at the money, 50 delta options or at the money options and in short term duration options. That's where gamma is really rich in these options, short term and at the money. The reason why at the money options have a 50 delta is because they have roughly a 50% chance of being in or out of the money. They're right at the money. And if you assume that a stock has what we call Brownian motion or random, relatively random price movements, the call and the put that are both 50 delta options right at the money have theoretically an equal percentage chance of being in the money or out of the money on the expiration date. That's why these options have around a 50 delta, but that's also why they have a lot of gamma. Far out of the money options generally are approaching a zero delta or a very low delta. Remember what I said about delta as a function of time as an option that is in the money, removes time out of it. As time comes out of it, it becomes more in the money. And as an option that is out of the money, has time removed from it, it becomes more out of the money. Meaning, as you, as you pull time out, that option that's in the money approaches the 100 delta, and the option that's out of the money approaches the zero delta. Well, what does that look like? It looks like this. This is delta as a function of time and gamma as a function of time. You might recognize this curve from the gamma slide that I put up there. Gamma is most concentrated where? In the at the money option that has the least amount of time in it. That means if we're talking about a $25 stock, these options, these 25 calls and puts are going to have the most gamma on the board. But what is their delta going to be? Well, their delta is going to be roughly 50. That means that as you pull time out of those options, they're not necessarily moving up toward the 100 bound or down toward the zero bound. 50 delta options, as you pull time out, stay relatively 50 delta options. But as you pull that time out, what you're doing is you're stretching these options over here up to the 100 delta bound and these options over here down to the zero delta bound. This represents the in the money calls 
and this represents the out of the money falls. Whereas this would represent the out of the money puts, and this would represent the in the money puts. As an option gets closer and closer to expiration, if it's in the money, it becomes more in the money. And as it's getting closer and closer to expiration, as, as it gets closer and closer to expiration, if it's out of the money, it becomes more out of the money. That's its delta moving toward 100 or toward zero. Those upper and, and lower bounds, a delta, one option can only have up to 100 delta or a zero delta. Those are the upper and lower bounds. And so what really happens is as you pull time out, those options get more and more and more extreme as far as their delta is concerned. And remember what delta is, delta is an option sensitivity to underlying move in price terms. So that means that that option is going to be more sensitive to an underlying move or less sensitive to an underlying move. Okay, let's talk about, so we've talked about delta, gamma, and vega as far as options are concerned and time. What I want to do now is drive home the idea of how zero day DTE options can work relative to 10 day, 30 day, and 90 day options. So I call this same move different delta. What I'm going to do here is give you three different buckets. The zero DTE option, this is an option that's expiring today, basically. It's a 50 delta call. It's right at the money, and the implied vol is a 50. Its price is 105 right now, and it has this much gamma, 15 gamma. Let's talk about the 10 DTE option. This is a two week option, same call, 50 delta, 10 days to expiration. Again, the underlying's a hundred bucks. It's the same stock, implied vol is the same. Look at its price, $3.53. This is a function of the more time you add to an option, the more value that is inside that option. But look at its gamma. It's roughly a third of what this gamma is. Remember what we looked at when we looked at how gamma looks as far as a function of time. As you go farther out in time, the gamma decreases. And then let's look at the 30 day option. Same option, 50 delta, 30 days to expiration. It's a hundred dollar underlying, same stock, same implied vol. The call price is $6 and one cent. And again, look at its gamma. Right? This is the actual curve that we talked about in actual motion right here. Right, This is a lot of gamma and not as much gamma. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to move this stock. Stock goes from 100 where we started up to 105. Stock's up five bucks, 5%. Now, let's look at what might happen to these options. Your zero DTE option goes from 105 to 502. Why is that? Because it's expiring today. And this option is now almost up to its 100% delta bound. So it starts to move one to one with the stock. And its price goes all the way up to 502. The new price of the 10 delta or the 10 DTE option goes from 353 up to 670. And that 30 day option goes from six bucks up to nine bucks. Now, you might look at this and say, well, these moves are pretty commensurate. This is like a $4 move here. This is like a $3 move here. And this is like a $3 move here. Like, what's the big difference between these? The big difference is that these prices don't tell the whole story. What tells you the whole story is how much they moved in percentage relative to how much they cost to put on. You're talking about a $1 option that went up 378% for a $5 move. That's a big difference. And I want you to think about if you have $10,000 to, to pay for premium, how many of these can you buy? A lot relative to these right? Because these are three times as expensive and this is six times as expensive. This is the reason why people look at this and talk about the potential of systemic risk. These options that are zero DTE options, relatively speaking, in price terms are cheap in just dollar terms, right? This is a dollar option. And thus, when you move a stock $5, this thing's going to move a lot. Because of those two forces we talked about, gamma and, and delta, as you're getting into that move, 
the delta of those options is really starting to take hold, you get a 378% change in how these options are priced. Now, this is a different change percentage-wise, obviously, but it's a function of how many days are left in that option. It's not going to move as much in percentage terms. So I want you to take a look at that as, a, as an example of how things can go up in value, but I also want you to think about how things might go down in value because the changes in the front of the curve are extreme, not only in up moves, but they're also extreme in down moves. Again, we have the same situation here. You have a zero DTE option, a 10 delta, a 10 day to expiration option, and a 30 day option. Underlying is 100 again, implied vol is 50 again. Same prices, we're using the same prices. What is the theta of this option? Remember what theta is. Theta is your model's estimation of how much that option is going to change if nothing happens over the next 24 hours. This is just a function of time. Nothing happens over the next day. This option is going to lose all of its value. Why? Because it's expiring today. This option has 10 days in it. What are you taking out of it? One of the 10 days. This option has 30 days in it. What are you taking out of it? One of the 30 days. That's why this theta is 16 cents and this theta is under 10 cents. And this is a dollar because the entire price of this option has to come out by the end of the day because it's fully extrinsic value. It's a 50 delta option. Let's look at the same move, which is nothing. Stock unchanged. You walk in today, stock's trading 100. You walk in tomorrow, guess what? Stock's trading 100. What happens to this call? It goes to zero. What happens to this call? It moves by its theta. Remember, 16 cents started out 353. Now it's worth 363 tomorrow. Same thing for that 30-day option. It moves down basically 10 cents. If you do this math and look at it from a percentage standpoint, you're going to get the same kind of explanation as to how much this is moving relative to its full value. The zero DTE option is down 100%. Why? Because it's theta for one day, if nothing happened, was its entire value. And thus, it's down 100%. If you were long that option, you lost 100% on that move. The 10-day option is down 5% relative to its actual price. And the 30-day option is down 2%. So this is meant to give you an idea of how over the course of one day, and utilizing the same move in the underlying, how these options might change in value based on how much time they have in them. This entire presentation is all about optionality and time. Because really what we're talking about is as you get closer to zero DTE options, you need to understand how time affects those options in different ways. We've talked about how it affects theta. We've talked about how it affects gamma. We've talked about how it affects delta, and we've talked about how it affects its, uh, its vega as well, all four of them, right? Vega becomes less, less, of a, less of a factor when you're dealing with the front of the curve because those options have very little vega in them. They're, very, they're not terribly sensitive to implied volatility movements. But this is really designed to tell you, pay attention to how these Greeks work when you're dealing with low DTE options because it makes a big difference, especially as a percentage of their value. Now, let's talk about vertical spreads because this is one of the hedging techniques that people like to use in general with options. And I'll tell you why. There's four basic vertical spreads. There's the bull call spread, which is a debit spread. There's a bear call spread, which is a credit spread. And then a bull put spread and a bear put spread, which is uh, a credit spread and a debit spread. We're going to focus on the bull call spread and the bear put spread. These are both debit spreads, meaning in order to put this spread on, you have to pay money. for it. These two spreads, bear call spreads and bull put spreads are spreads where if you put them on option wise, you actually are collecting money. on. They're called credit spreads. Let's talk about the call debit vertical or the bull call spread, the debit vertical. Why do people trade these? Number one is 
they are generally bullish on the underlying. Why? Because these spreads tend to increase in value as the underlying goes up. The nice part about debit spreads is that they have a defined risk and reward characteristic to them. I'll explain that in a moment. They also generally have favorable break-even points relative to one option because you have one option that's long and one option that's short in it. The profit potential of these spreads is very heavily influenced by how much you pay for them. The reason why is because if you are trading a $5 vertical spread, meaning you're long the $100 call and you're short the 105 call, there's $5 of distance between those two strikes, the most that spread can be worth is the distance between the strikes if you're trading at one for one. So the most that $5 call spread can be worth is $5. That's why we say the profit potential is heavily influenced by the premium paid because there's a big difference between paying a dollar for a call spread that can only be worth $5 or paying $4 for a call spread that can only be worth $5. There's a huge difference in the amount that you pay versus how much that call spread could be worth. You need to factor that into how you're using these. The nice part about the risk control here is that they have defined profit potential. Like I just said, the most it can be worth is five bucks. They also have defined maximum loss. The most you can lose on these spreads is how much you're paying for them. But also position monitoring is critical for a couple of different reasons. Let's take a look at a real world example here of a call debit spread. Stock XYZ is trading 80 and a quarter. You have about 28 days to expiration. We're going to look at the 80-85 the call spread. When you're trading the 80-85 call spread, you are buying the 80 call, the one that is closer to at the money, and you are selling the 85 call, the one that is farther away from the money. These are the prices in, in, uh, in this scenario. We'll use 205 and 70 cents. I'm going to use the same prices for the put side of things so you can see how this actually plays. Because you're paying 205 for one option and you're you're actually debiting that amount from your account, you are selling the other option at 70 cents or crediting that amount to your account because this is a spread. You offset one versus the other. How much does the spread cost? It costs $1.35. That's 205 for the call you bought, 70 cents you're taking in for the call you sold. You are paying 135 for this call spread. Now you are long what we would call long the 80-85 call spread. This is a bullish call spread. Let's look at what it looks like from a PL standpoint. Remember, we bought the 80s, we sold the 85s. You're long this call for 205 and you're short this call for 70 cents. Net debit is 135. You paid $135 for this. Because you paid $135 for it, your max profit is going to be $3.65. Where does that come from? Remember what I said earlier, the 80-85 call spread is a $5 call spread. How much can it be worth at its maximum point, the distance between the strikes? So because it's a $5 call spread, the most it can be worth is five bucks. When it's at its highest point, when it's worth $5, what? is the actual amount of profit that you are getting from it. Well, you paid 135 for it already and it's worth $5. So your max profit is $3.65. That's at 85. When both of these calls are almost at, one of them is fully in the money and one of them is at the money at that point in time. When you're trading spreads like this, the most that these spreads can be worth is when the call that you're long or the option that you're long is worth the most it can be worth at the same time, the option you're sh short is worth the least that it can be worth. 85 is that point in this call spread because the 80s are worth $5 at 85 and the 85s that you're short, remember, were zero. And so at that point in time, that call spread is worth $5. Now, the most you can make on it is $3.65. That's because it's worth five bucks here and you paid $1.35 for it. The most you can lose on debit spreads is what you paid for. You paid $1.35 for it. That's how much you can lose. 
If the stock finishes 80 or below, you're going to lose $1.35 on this spread. Now, the break even you look at and you add the amount you paid for it to the lower strike. And so the break even is 81.35 in this situation because you need this spread to be worth at least $1.35 in order for you to break even. That's what you paid for. And up to 81.35, that 80 call starts to be worth 135. And then above that, that call expands right up until the point where 85 kicks in and your 85 call starts to expand. But at that point in time, this call spread is still worth $5 up here. This is what it looks like when you have defined risk, right? Flat parts of the PL graph are defined risk. If you have a PL graph that looks like this, that's straight up and down and has no flat parts to it, you do not have defined risk. You have what we call open ended risk. All spreads and put spreads have defined risk because you are long one option and short another option. All right, let's look at the same thing, but on the put side. Put debit spreads are the exact same thing, but in the opposite direction. You have a bearish outlook on the underlying. Why? Because these put spreads generally expand in value when the stock goes down. You again have defined risk reward, favorable break even points relative to a single option because you're long one option and short another option. Again, profit potential here, heavily influenced by the amount that you pay for this spread. I'm going to say this again. There's a big difference between paying $4 for a spread that can only be worth $5 and paying $1 for a spread that can only be worth $5. There's a huge difference in what you're paying versus what it can be worth in that situation. That's especially relevant when you're talking about zero DTE options. Because as we showed earlier, those zero DTE options tend to have lower premium amounts because they have lower amounts of time in them. They have less time for them to play out from an iterative process as far as price settlement is concerned. Risk control here is the same. Define profit potential, define maximum loss, and you need to pay attention to your position as far as where you're long and where you're short options. That is critical as far as the actual position monitoring of these options. Let's look at the exact same situation, but we're going to move the stock a little bit. 28 days to expiration. It's the 95-90 put spread. So you are long the 95s, which are closer to that, the money. You're short the 90s, farther away. Again, I said we're going to use the same prices here. It helps to be able to just look at it from the other perspective. The actual price distribution is going to be moving to the downside here, but we're using the same prices. So the spread itself costs $1.35 again. In this case, you would be what we would call long the 90-95 put spread or the 95-90 or the 95 90 put spread. That means you're long the 95s and you're short the 90s. This is a bearish spread. Why? Because it's probably going to go up in value as the stock goes down. Let's look at what that looks like. It's going to look very similar to you, but we're just going to take that P&L graph and we're going to flip it. Instead of the value of that spread going up as the stock goes up, the value of this spread goes up as the stock goes down. And this is why. You are long the 95s. You're long the 95 put. You're short the 90 put. In this case, again, you paid $1.35 for it. This is your defined risk over here, right? This is your defined payout up here. This is how much it can be worth. Remember, this spread, because it's a one-to-one -one put spread, can only be worth the difference between the stripes. The most this spread can be worth is $5. If the stock goes down from 95 all the way down to 90, remember, spreads are worth the most they can be worth when the option you're long is worth the most and the option you're short is worth the least that it can be. That happens to be 90 in this case because these 95 puts are in the money and the 90 puts are out of the money, meaning at expiration, these have intrinsic value and these have no value. They're going to expire worthless because the stock went out at 90 or below. So 95 puts when you're going down are going up in value. This 
put that you paid two dollars and five cents for when you're at the 90 strike is going to be worth five dollars of intrinsic value and those 90 puts are going to go out theoretically worthless so this stock or this this put spread is going to expand to be worth the most that it can possibly be worth what's the most it can possibly be worth the difference between the strikes if you're at 90, this put spread is going to be worth $5. What did you pay for it? You paid $1.35 for it. What does that work out to profit-wise? One, it works out to $3.65. The max loss on this, again, when you're dealing with debit spreads, the most you can lose on a debit spread is what you paid for. So in this case, again, you paid $1.35 for it. This is defined risk. Defined risk are flat parts of your P&L curve. Anytime you see a flat part of your P&L curve, you should think that is a defined risk moment. This is defined reward, right? As you get down to 90, this put spread becomes worth $5. That's the most that it can ever be worth. And it's never going to be worth more than $5 because it can't be worth more than $5. That's defined reward, okay? Those are two of the things that are really important about debit spreads. The most you can lose on a debit spread is what you paid for it, as long as it's a one-by-one one spread. And the most you can make on a debit spread is what you paid for it subtracted from the most that it can be worth, which is the difference in the strikes. So that's the big difference as far as debit spreads versus credit spreads. They both have defined characteristics as far as risk is concerned, but debit spreads, you're actually paying for them. You're debiting your account a certain amount for them. And thus that's the amount that you can lose on them is your defined risk amount as far as debit spreads are concerned. Now, many people like to use these spreads across the curve in lots of different ways but they become especially pertinent to very low DTE options, options that have very few days left in them or zero days left in them because of their defined risk characteristics. People like to use these when they're dealing with zero DTE options because on a day where you only have one price iteration of the underlying that's going to define how much that option is going to be worth at the end of the day, Many times people look at what we just talked about as far as the percentage of change in value that you might incur over the course of one day and think about that and think that might be too much risk for me. Well, a great way to actually utilize these spreads and utilize the defined risk that exists within them is to use them in the front of the curve in those zero DTE options. It gives you a way to actually trade in that part of the curve without necessarily incurring open-ended risk. And that's why I like to talk about them debit spreads inclusive of the zero DTE part of this, because it's a way to meld those two things together and to think about why zero DTE options work the way that they work. And then how might I still be able to take part in that part of the trading and be able to do it with defined risk. So that's part of why I talk about it the way that I talk about it. I hope that people have taken something away from this. And I know that it's a ton of information. Zero DTE is always something that people um, are interested in talking about. But if you want to talk more about zero DTE options or any part of the options curve, make sure to check us out at optionseducation.org. It's a wonderful, wonderful resource where we have all of our educational resources that are there. And um, you can always send us emails at options at the OCC.com as well. Like I said in the beginning, we're not registered investment advisors, but we love to talk about options and we can help educate you as to how these options work. And hopefully you can utilize that knowledge to better to, to make better investment decisions as far as your options are concerned. So um Hey, Zeus, what do you think about some questions? Do we have time or no? Yes, yes. Let's uh, let's see if we can address some of the questions. As you think of the questions you want to ask, let me go ahead and launch a poll here uh, so that I can get your input on the webinar. And uh, that will help us, you know, guide us uh, towards more webinars around topics like this one. 
that um, <clears throat> Matt explained very, 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 um, very detailed. Matt, great presentation, by the way. <laughs> oh, I thanks, think, Jesus. I appreciate yeah. it. I know it's a it's a ton of information, but I it I is like give people as much information as we can. Yeah, yeah, and I and I can totally feel you. There's it's tough to squeeze all that information into one presentation, but yeah, um. There is one question that is here. Um, will the zero DTE option trade, will it be considered a day trade? That's a question from the chat. Oh, that's a really good answer. And I think, or that's a really good question. And yeah. <laughs> I think the answer to that is um, yes. When you're dealing with zero DTE options, generally speaking, if you're trading them and they're expiring on the same day, I believe that they are categorized as a day. Okay. Um, a little bit about the risks of a credit spread versus a debit spread. Could you talk a yeah, little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. The main difference here between a credit spread and a debit spread is basically just the difference in those two words, right? Credit versus debit. They're both going to have defined risk characteristics, and they're both going to have defined profit potential. The reason why they have defined risk and profit is because they have one long option versus one short option. Right? Any spread that looks like that is going to have defined risk and profit potential. The big difference here is that with a debit spread, you're paying for it. And so in those situations, the option you're buying is usually worth more than the option you're selling. And so if you're paying $3 for an option and you're selling another option for 70 cents, you're going to be debiting your account $2.30. Now, what that means is that generally speaking, the option that you're going to be buying is going to be closer to at the money. And thus you're going to actually, remember, option buyers have rights and option sellers have obligations. So when you're dealing with being long the option that's closer to at the money, you have the right to exercise that option. And thus, because it's closer to at the money, there's probably an increased likelihood that it might be in the money at the end of its life cycle. And so that's part of the reason why that option costs more than the one that you're selling, right? Is that it has a higher likelihood of potentially finishing in the money. Now, if you're paying for something and you're debiting your account that, the way options work is that debits and credits happen at the exact same time as you're trading it. And so what I'm talking about there is that if you pay for something, the options, the price of that option comes out of your account as a debit when you pay for it. And that never changes. The option gets marked on a daily basis, but the actual amount that you pay for it never changes. The same is true if you sell that option or you create a credit spread. When you're crediting your account, that amount of money comes into your account and it never changes. But what does change is the price of that option as time goes on, it gets marked at different prices at different days but the amount that you credit to your account stays in your account regardless of what happens. It's how much that option is worth at its expiration that actually matters as far as the P&L is concerned. So that's mm. really the difference between those two. Mm. Interesting, interesting. Um, I may have launched the wrong webinar now that, I mean the, the, the wrong poll, but it's okay. Uh, still, you know, if the question is referencing a straddle, just uh, think about the zero DTE presentation that we talked about today. Uh, we had a straddle presentation not long ago, and then we created a poll specific for that. And you're kind of wondering why is he mentioning straddles if we didn't? Oh, talk okay, I got today. you. So it's uh, just uh, just think about you know what the presentation was about today, and then answer you know based on that. Um, Matt. Um, in terms of margin, I, I, every broker handles margin differently. So if yeah. you have any questions on margin related to these types of trades, contact our trade desk and they'll go over you know, how margin works for any of these trades. Um, yeah. Any cases where zero DTE options are most suitable? Well, um, that's kind of a, a little bit of a loaded topic, right? Most suitable versus least suitable. It's kind of like, uh, the way that I always answer those questions are options are incredibly flexible and they can be suitable in lots of different ways, depending on what your investment objectives are. I think that it's really important that what you understand is all of those things that I talked about at the beginning of the presentation, as far as how these zero DTE options, they're, they're risk characteristics, right? I think it's important. Everyone theoretically should have their own idea of like, what are my suitable risks for myself? 
and my position and my my actual like my p l what am i willing to lose what am i willing to make what am i you know those kinds of things and what i really stress when i teach this topic is i can't tell you what's suitable or what's a best situation for zero dte options what i can tell you is this is how optionality works when you subtract time from the equation. When you get closer and closer and closer to expiration, these are the risks that are inherent within these options. And you need to understand that as deeply as you possibly can in order to make decisions when you're dealing with zero DTE options, because guess what? Zero DTE options are expiring that day. And whether or not they're in the money or out of the money, they're still going to expire at the end of the day, right? You don't, you're not dealing with a 30 or a 60 or a 90 day option that has, you know, 29 more price iterations or 39 or 49 or 59 more price iterations. You get one price iteration, right? The settlement at the end of the day is what determines whether or not this option is in the money or out of the money. Mm -hmm. The more you understand about the risks of optionality and time, the better you're going to be able to like, make those decisions as to what's suitable for your account. That's the real yeah. point. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And in, in terms of risk, there's no Greek for assignment risk, right? This is something that traders should be aware of, but- um... Yeah, that's a really good, I, I wish there was a Greek for assignment <laughs> risk, but if there was, I might've, I mean, my, my options career might've been a lot more successful a lot earlier <laughs> on because it takes a while for you to kind of, understand inherently and intrinsically what your assignment risk mm -hmm. is as you get closer and closer to expiration. And mm -hmm. oftentimes, you know, at the beginning of my career, it takes so many times for you to watch it and watch it happen before you understand how it actually works in front of you. Mm -hmm. The funny part about, you know, when traders talk about this that have been trading for a long time, we always talk about the fact that the lessons that you learn that you never forget are the ones that are really expensive. Right. Like, That's right. unfortunately, that happens to be the case. Right. The more something costs you, the less likely you are to forget it over time. There's mm -hmm. no Greek that gives you an uh, an assignment risk. But what I can tell you is that Delta is a really good proxy for that as you get closer to expiration. Mm -hmm. If you're dealing with an option that has an exceptionally high Delta, remember, the upper bound of Delta is 100. So the closer you get to 100 Delta, the more likely that option theoretically is to expire in the money. And thus, if you're dealing with something like assignment or you're dealing with options that are American style options, those are the options that are going to have a slightly elevated risk of expiration mm -hmm. assignment, right? Like a hundred Delta option is much more likely to be exercised and thus assigned than a zero Delta option. Hmm. Interesting. Um, from your experience, man, Greeks, do they behave differently for options, I mean, futures options that trade more hours than equity options? No, I, the, the Greeks, you know, I, when I talk about optionality, I always talk about how it's applicable across lots of different asset classes and the optionality itself is the same across the board. What you're going to see when you're dealing with possible asset classes that are trading, you know, for let's say something like Bitcoin or something that trades, you know, 24 hours a day. It's going to have a slightly different characteristic at different parts of its trading cycle during the day, mm -hmm. potentially because of the amount of people that are involved in the marketplace at that point in time, mm -hmm. right? And that mm -hmm. generates a certain amount of liquidity versus a different time that might generate a certain different amount of liquidity, but the Greeks are the same across that entire spectrum. Right. The Greeks of those options, the Greeks are a function of time and mm -hmm. time to expiration and things like implied volatility and um, the risk free rate and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're not necessarily a function of like what point during the day you're trading as mm -hmm. opposed to like if it trades yeah. at night versus if it trades. <laughs> True. There's a question here from a, from an attendee that says, what do you think about selling options to get a credit? I don't like them. That's part of the comment. <laughs> um, I'm not well, sure. <laughs> I think if you don't like them, then you um, <laughs> then you probably need to think about what your risks are when you're selling yeah. options, right? Selling options creates open-ended risk. 
Mm -hmm. If you're just naked short options, you have what we call open-ended risk. You have infinite risk on one side or the other of the price distribution. And mm -hmm. if you're selling both calls and puts, you might have open-ended risk on both sides of the price mm -hmm. distribution. Mm -hmm. Now, generally speaking, the premium that you're actually collecting for selling those options should theoretically be commensurate with the amount of risk that you're taking on. And thus, you you know what people call get compensated or paid for taking that risk. Mm -hmm. But if you don't want to sell options, then you don't want to sell options. I totally mm -hmm. understand that. The way that you might approach it is potentially like what I talked about with those with those debit spreads. There's the exact same thing, but on the other side, it's a credit spread, mm -hmm. which means you can actually sell optionality, sell premium, but have defined risk because you're long one option and short another option. It just so happens that the option that you're short might be worth more than the option you're long. Mm -hmm. And so that price differential decays over time and you're short that amount of premium but you still have defined risk because you're long one and short the other. So that might be a way that you could maybe kind of like dip your toe into the option selling world and not have open-ended risk. You could have yeah. defined risk and trade credit spreads instead of just selling straddles or selling strangles, right? Which yeah. is open-ended risk. And that's yeah. how I would kind of answer that question. Good. Here's a quick one. What time is expiration on that zero DTE option? Is it 4 p.m.? Uh, Eastern. Yeah. It expires at, at 3 PM central, um, or it prints at 3 PM central usually. And then there's a, there's usually a, a short period of time where they continue to trade after that close, which is usually designated as a time for people to get in or out of their actual positions. But one thing that I always stress when I talk about expiration is you need to make sure that you understand where your brokerage or trading firm actually has a cutoff for exercise or assignment uh, contra um, advice that you would give in situations where you definitely want to exercise an option, don't want to exercise an option, because each brokerage firm, in order to control its operational risk, has a different window as to how far past expiration they will actually allow you to put those contra exercise advice windows in. So make sure you understand that in your brokerage because it's different in different brokers. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, we may have just a few more minutes for more questions here, but um, if you're bullish, what factors might cause you to buy a call spread versus selling a put spread? Oh, buying a call spread versus selling a put spread. That's a good question. Um, because both of those, for those who are uninitiated, both of those are what we would call long delta spreads or uh, bullish spreads. Being short a put spread and being long a call spread are both spreads that would work to the upside, theoretically speaking. And they're both long delta spreads. The big difference between them is just going to be whether or not you're paying for the optionality or receiving funds to give the optionality to someone else, right? If you're short a put spread, you're going to be short the higher strike put and long the lower strike put. And thus you are going to have given someone else the right to exercise that higher strike put. Whereas you maintain the right to exercise the lower strike put. And in the opposite of that, that call spread being long a call spread, you're going to actually maintain the right to exercise the lower strike call, whereas you will have sold the right to exercise the higher strike call to someone else. And thus they would have the right to exercise that call. That's why they both actually create the same long delta exposure. But in one situation, you're gonna be collecting money and thus you're also going to be incurring exercise risk or exer uh, assignment risk because you're short that strike. And the other side, you're going to be paying money but you're going to be holding the cards as it were, as far as the exercise is concerned, you have the right to exercise that lower strike call. Hmm. Very nice. And um, one last question, you know, I, I mean, I, we may not have time to address every single question here in the chat. And I apologize that beforehand, you do have a way of contacting the OIC for additional education and also our team, if you want to, to get additional you know, information on this webinar, but um we're not favoring any strategy over another. So even though the focus here was debit spreads, 
uh, we're not saying that debit spreads are better than credit spreads uh, in terms of zero DTE strategies. Yeah. I don't think that was the, what we tried to do here, right? Right, Matt? No, 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 no. I completely agree with you there, Jesus. I yeah. mean, like the the I think one thing that I try to stress as much as possible when I'm doing this is that that the idea here is to educate people as to how the options work and then allowing them to make their decisions based on what their risk preference is. And there's no difference necessarily between debit and credit spreads as far as usability. It's really just in understanding how the optionality works and mm -hmm. thus being able to apply it when you when when it when it lines up with where you think things might be or be going or your you know your investment thesis basically that's it you know i know there's m m many more questions there in the chat but um because of time we're not going to be able to address those but um matt i want to say thank you for your time and thank you for presenting this topic for us absolutely it's been a it pleasure a today i hope that i can come back real soon and do it again we'll talk about something else next time We'll do it again for sure. And everyone, thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, please check out our event schedule and um, upcoming topics on webinars. And I look forward to seeing everyone in one of our future classes. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>